beekeepers that are used to keeping their bees outdoors, say in California or Texas all winter, have an opportunity to feed bees that are too light for winter. They have opportunities to fix queenless issues. But if the beekeeper is storing indoors, they have to do all that work ahead of time, right? So there's no chances to fix colonies that are too light in October or fix queen issues. So the colonies need to be heavy, they need to be well fed, the mites need to be under control months before they arrive in the storage. My operation, shipping bees to almonds, begins in October in North Dakota. And as soon as the temperatures are in the 50s and lower in the daytime, we start gathering up the hives and shipping them to Idaho, where they'll be prepared to go into our cold storage facility. And in those preparations, we'll do last minute feeding, and we'll do culling of, of weak and dead colonies so that we have just good live colonies going into the sheds. These are some bees we just brought in from North Dakota. They arrived last night. We're just kind of doing one quick pass through them, giving them a one last mite treatment, pulling out anything that's bad uh, that they may have missed or, or went bad since they last looked at them in North Dakota. These particular bees have been fed four to six times, I'm not exactly sure, with syrup and protein patties. Been treated for mites starting into August, treated up, got them clean, we're doing one last mite treatment on them and then just basically going through anything that's lights, getting one last feeding. Right now it's cold and cloudy, it's supposed to be 60, 60 and sunny here any time, so they should take that last gallon of syrup. But these bees are basically ready to put away. It's just uh, making one quick pass through them to, to finalize and make sure they're good. and and uh, these will go, go get put away in a couple weeks. These will probably be the last bees that we put in storage. They're the first bees out of North Dakota. We put the bees in storage for uh, two reasons. The first reason is to get them out of the winter, out of the cold weather, keep the hive as large as we can, as many bees in the colony as we can, because we want to take them to California this time of year and set them out for almond pollination. We want the hives to be as large as possible when they do that. It's kind of against nature to have a large hive of bees this time of year, but that's what the almond growers need in California. They need large hives of bees to pollinate when those trees start to bloom the first of February. And so that is the first reason why we put them into storage. The second reason is, is that we can control how much feed they consume. If we keep them at the optimal temperature, we're able to reduce the amount of feed that they consume and, and thereby saves us some money and keeps them from starving to death during the winter. They're breaking everything in half right there. Uh, if they see something that's a problem or whatever, they're gonna pull that in. They're feeding the light ones, so if that box isn't really, really heavy, they're gonna feed it. So to give it an extra gallon of syrup right at the end, kind of a last make sure we kind of even them up. We, we predominantly feed the pro sweet or the that type of a blend like a sucrose fructose blend. We don't see a huge problem with that. That's what this is. This, it usually does not ferment in the hive so I mean if they don't eat this whatever we're putting in them now I think they're gonna eat it just fine but if they don't consume it it'll be fine when it gets to California. You do got to be careful if you're feeding like a one-to-one -one sugar syrup it could ferment over the winter that could be a problem. Uh, corn syrup that's been diluted too much could could create a problem. It also has honeybee healthy in it. The last round we always feed around to honeybee healthy. Uh, I think that kind of maintains the integrity of the syrup if they don't get it ate, so you're fine there. Um, protein, this is Nutri B, I'll give him a plug, he'll like that. Usually whatever they don't eat, whatever's in there, as soon as they hit the ground in California, they go crazy for it. They're not really brooding now, it's kind of slowed up for the season, but it, uh, we've never, we haven't seen a huge problem with having like a half a pound left over going through. Um, as soon as they hit the ground, if you crack them open, you'll see it in there, you come back in four or five days, it's gone. They just really go crazy, crazy for that protein when they, they start brooding heavy right there. Unfortunately, the Varroa survive in the cold weather as well. We try to get good control before the bees go into storage in the fall. I think we achieve as good a control as we're able to with, with the tools that we have at our disposal at this time. But we still have loss from Varroa. I would estimate that most of the loss that we experience in winter storage is due to Varroa or the, or the the viruses that the Varroa have vectored into the hives. Varroa, we've 
we've hit them pretty hard aggressively for Varroa starting in August. This last deal we're putting on them right now is kind of a final cleanup with oxalic. The idea is they're not broodless. This is we wait as long as we can in the fall to give them that because you know the oxalic only kills the Varroa on the bee, but it's kind of a last treatment. We also will hit them about a week after they hit the ground in California. We'll hit them again with oxalic to try to because we can't we can't really get them when they're broodless. They're actually broodless when they're in the building. Um, and then Nosema, what? That's a one. That one, uh, I, I'll touch lightly on it. We've had some really, really high Nosema counts on some really, really good hives of bees. Uh, I guess my take on Nosema is, if your bees are really, really healthy and really well fed and don't have any other problems, they seem to be able to handle a, a considerable amount of Nosema. We haven't used Fumadel for several years. It's probably been five or six. Whenever they took it off the market there for a while, we kind of had to quit using it and we never went back to it. Um, we'll see, come January, maybe it'll bite me. Requeening, we do all that in the spring. Uh, we start in basically April and April, May, June, a little bit into July, but we try to get everything requeened. Brood wise, I would guess, I don't know, I'd have to go look at them to see what they have for brood coming out of North Dakota, but I mean, they're probably three to four frames still, pretty good size frames of brood going in. I don't know if that's ideal or not, but we, we kind of pulled the pollen sub away mid-October, kind of felt like we'd raised enough bees and kind of try to slow them up a little bit, or, or they kind of slow up on their own. As soon as it starts getting cold, they just kind of quit, but it's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, you want them broodless so you can get rid of some of the mites and, and they winter better, but then, you know, well, that, maybe one or two more frames of brood wouldn't be a bad thing to make sure that we get to where we want to be if first of February. Yeah. Pollinating almonds is not a January and February job. It's a, it's a year-round job. We start planning for 2021 pollination in 2019. And so we're preparing for the shipping and the receiving and all of the intricate details of, of managing those hives more than a year out in order to be able to do it effectively. Ideally, I mean, I pretty much want to see them pretty full of bees. I mean, with a solid, solid box of honey on them. Ideally, if you had two, two frames of honey in the deep and a solid box of honey and 12 frames, I mean, I think these will max at 14 is what they can, they're a deep and a medium, so they can max out at 14 frames. I mean, I don't know if I want them. Well, when I hit the ground in California, I kind of like to see them buzzed over. It's, it's just a lot easier if they're better. It just makes my life a lot simpler if they're all really good. Then what we generally see is this is what I'm going to see the 1st of February when I unload these in California. I mean, I'm not going to say, I mean, to say that they're all going to be perfect, no, there'll be one or two. They'll, we'll lose another, you know, five or ten out of this load for sure. Just, I mean, they might smash a queen today, who knows. But uh, but that's basically what I, what I want to put in the almonds, and that's what I'll put in the almonds. What I have here is what's going to go in the, in the almonds. We have 456 hives here, one semi load. Uh, we're bringing about 20 trucks from North Dakota. That's of our own. We store about 80 loads total. Most of the the lesser hives have been culled out of these back a month ago. I mean, there, there's all no matter what we do, we'll, these guys are going to go through these, and I guarantee it. We'll haul them to California. There'll be a couple more show up, but it should be a really small percentage. There's no advantage to me of hauling a bunch of poor hives to California and trying to rent them. And then the other thing is, I have we have time in the winter time to get that equipment cleaned up and ready to go. And then the other thing is kind of peace of mind. If I know that I got my bees are all shined up and ready to go, I'm going to put them in there. I'm going to get a paycheck on those. And I know I've got X amount to make up. You know, we don't have a very bad winter loss, but our summer loss can be pretty, pretty extreme. I mean, we've culled aggressively to get to here. And so, I mean, we usually figure from what we say put into a honey flow on the 1st of June to what I rent in the almonds is probably you know, 25% loss, but we're only losing about five to 10% over the winter. Basically, if those rent, they're gonna make me $220. If they don't rent, they're gonna cost me $300. That's kind of how we look at it. In my mind, when these guys get done, I'm gonna rent 95% of these. So if I, if I was just gonna say, well, I think we're gonna rent 70%, we, we might rent 80%. We hope we rent 90%, but I, I'm pretty confident we're gonna rent 90 plus percent of these. and. So I kind of can make a plan to go, I can feel comfortable. I mean, we're gonna hold back 10% to make sure we cover our butts a little bit and make sure that we don't short somebody. But 
I don't, really don't want to be thinking, well, I, you know, I don't know, it could be 60, 70 percent of rent and the other 30 or 40 percent might. And 30 percent of, I mean, it's just not, we're not going to make any money doing that. An indoor storage is not going to fix your bees. It's just going to maintain a good hive of bees so that I, basically I can put these bees away in two, three weeks and pull them out just like that. That's what I want to put in the almonds. I mean, that's, that is a pollinating unit. We can't, get, we can't really get them any better than that. And so, but basically what I'm going to use the indoor storage for is to maintain that. I can't, I'm not going to go in there and build, build bees in the storage. It's just a place to put them. I know if I, if I put them in there, they're going to come out looking like that.